The hard part is people don't realize you get numb to those things. You look at your watch every single day for months and months and months and years and years and years. It's not as cool. It's cool to the people that see it for the first time, just like a magic trick. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. My guest today is probably one of the most connected people uh, you'll ever hear of or meet. I, it's just a, amazing just how connected this guy is. Dan Fleischman, he's one of the youngest founders of a publicly traded company in history. He licensed his apparel company for $9.5 million at the age of 19, went on to scale the drink uh, energy drink products into 55,000 retail stores. He co-founded the 100 million mastermind experience, so spoke at over 200 business events, angel invested in 36 companies, and his agency Elevator Studio has spent over $60 million with social media influencers, fashion brands, film studios, mobile apps, and consumer products. Uh, but most importantly, you'll, you'll hear him talk about one of the most important things to him near and dear to his heart is his model citizen fund charity, which creates backpacks for the homeless, uh, filled with 150 emergency supplies inside, uh, just a really great conversation. You're going to enjoy this one. Check it out. Dan, absolute pleasure. Welcome. Great having you here. Thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. My pleasure. So I just want to get some background. You know, some people may know who you are. Some people may not, even though you're, you're super omnipresent. Um, but I'd love to hear about your story and how you got started as an entrepreneur uh, and, you know, all the way to becoming one of the most connected people I've actually ever met. Successful too, but, but definitely super, super connected. So in high school, I was working three jobs. I'll, st- I'll try to give you the fast forward version. Uh, I saved up a bunch of money to go to college and saved $43,000. I was working three jobs, selling cotton candy at the stadium, peanuts and Cracker Jacks. And uh, I ended up starting a clothing brand at 17. And I started sorry, sorry, t-shirt. sorry. I, I just got to ask, do you have like that popcorn voice? Can you do like that popcorn? Peanuts, Cracker Jacks, here. There, okay, there we go. So yeah, I can flick a whole bag of peanuts all the way up an entire stadium, like a full level. Impressive. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I got to add that to my bio. So I was uh, working at the stadium, saving up money, and I was working at Ruby's Diner, et cetera. And 17 years old, I ended up starting a clothing brand. And I'm printing t-shirts, putting this catchphrase on the t-shirts. And we sell through 100 shirts at 15 bucks each. I'm like, whoa, at $1,500, I'm a millionaire. And so decide we're going to trademark the brand, go to a clothing convention, end up doing a million dollars in orders, have no idea how to fulfill orders because we didn't know a manufacturer that could handle it. Um, Found one by 19, we did $9.5 million licensing deal with Starter Apparel. Uh, 23, we took it public on the stock market so that I could launch the brand to do an energy drink under the same brand name. Uh, had trademarked 300 products in a bunch of different continents, which was very expensive and a big headache, and, but it was worth it because we were licensing the name out in different countries. And then from 23 years old to 27, I don't really remember much, right? Like all I did was go sell go to sleep, wake up, go sell, go to sleep, wake up, go sell. Got us into 55,000 retail stores in America through 43 distributors. But this is before social media. So I'm literally driving and flying to every distributor around the country. Um, And then I wake up, I'm 27 years old. It's been 10 years since I started the company in high school. On the 10 year anniversary, I resigned so I could put another feather in my cap. And so I decided I'm gonna start an online poker site. Don't know how, have no plan. I'm just going to do it because I want to start a poker site like poker. So I see a void in the market to make the coolest poker site uh, because Bodog was focusing on sports and not poker. So I put on a backpack. I moved to a place called Malta. Never heard of Malta before. And I just moved there for two years and build a poker site. Within 10 weeks, we're live. And within 10 months, we're the third biggest poker brand in the world. And I'm, I'm signed like Dan Bilzerian, DJ Steve Aoki, Mix them with Playboy Playmates, poker pros, TV shows, magazines, creating content when content was just getting started back in 2009, 10. And so, you know, we're getting you on YouTube, we're getting 4 million views, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but 4 million on YouTube back then was like, oh my God, we're breaking, you know, we're breaking the internet. And so we were doing whatever we could back in the MySpace days and Twitter days uh, before Instagram and Snapchat, TikTok existed. So I did that, had a really good run. And then we think everything's, we're crushing it. Companies worth $65 million and then pff, online poker is shut down in America. That's it. It's over. Throw in the towel. And so I had a decision to make. I could stay live overseas, but close down America, which was 
more than 50% of my player base, or I could just, you know, do what I did. I, I didn't feel comfortable not paying the, the, not paying the players back because my opponents, my competitors, they weren't paying the players back and they owed them billions of dollars because the government seized their money. Government didn't take a penny from me. They never even called me because my side was doing things correctly compared to what they were doing. And so it worked out where the next four days I manually paid back 41,000 people, uh, which was not easy. Again, technology back then was not as good as it is now. This is almost a decade ago, but I could sleep at night. And so I did like 80 news interviews that week. It was the toughest, craziest scenario to make sure that everybody knew, look, I'm paying everyone back for the next four days. Um, make sure if you guys had deposits, come get it. Otherwise, we're just going to manually forcefully send it to you via. So that was the hardest moment and the best moment because it set me up for the rest of my life. One, I became the good guy in the space because I was the only one to pay everyone back. Two, I started getting consulting gigs from Morgan Stanley, four land-based casinos. Everybody was hiring me to be the consultant for them for online gaming because I was the clean cut guy in the space where everybody else was dead or in jail. I was alive and well in America. And then three, it made me realize never have all my eggs in one basket ever again. And so from that moment, I started a social media agency, which I'm still running now all these years later. I became an angel investor. I started angel investing in the 36 companies since then. And so that changed my entire mindset of things where I was all in on this one company my whole life. And the company before that was just one company my whole life. And so I was always all in on one thing at a time. Not to say that you shouldn't do that, but for me, it was scary because in both instances, there was this turning point moment that I just wanted to stop or had to stop. And so now my main passion is my charity where I make backpacks for the homeless with 150 items inside. And I'm going to continue to keep angel investing in my social media agency. You know, that's, we spend around $60 million with influencers for brands, products, and mobile apps. So that was kind of the storyline of how everything came from high school till today. Amazing. I, I got to ask, because you said you played poker in your mind, what skills transfer from poker to the business world? Sure. So patience is the first one. You know, poker players, you can't go play poker for an hour. It's not how it works. You got to go in there for a full session. It's going to be four to 20, four to 12 hours on average. Most hands are just folding. Most hands are not playing. You got to pick, <clears throat> you have to pick your best situations, pick your best spots, pick your best things that you think you're going to be able to take advantage of and pick your best opponents to fight against, right? You don't want to always play against the poker pro at the table when there's weaker opponents. The so same thing in competition. If you're going to open up a pizza shop, don't open it next door to Domino's, right? You can open up next to a pizza, another pizza shop. Don't do it next to the to Domino's and Pizza Hut, right? Because they're going to spend way more money in the local area. Similar concepts. Um, and then obviously negotiation and interrogation. And so when you're interviewing someone or when you're negotiating with someone, you're looking at human behavior. At a poker table, you're trying to understand why are they leaning forward? Why are they looking back at their cards so many times? Why they keep touching their ear or their neck? Why are, they, why are they shaking? Are they shaking from excitement or are they shaking from their nervousness? There's two different types of shaking. Everybody thinks, oh, they must be bluffing because they're shaking. No, when you get a full house or a flush, you start shaking because you're so excited. You're going to get the other opponent's money, right? That's what they think about you. So they start shaking. So the same thing in negotiation. Sometimes you'll say something that triggers and they lean forward. Well, you know that you got them excited because they're leaning forward, right? Sometimes you'll say something and they'll cross their arms. Well, you might've hit a, a, a bad spot there, right? And so understanding why they're doing what they're doing is critical in, in poker and in business. And, and I guess the next question from, from your story just that comes to mind is, what lessons have you learned from making so much money at a young age that you know now that you wish you knew back then? So I learned very early because I was living with uh, professional football players. And so I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, living with these very famous football players at the time. Well, they're still famous at this time. Um, and one of them passed away. But I watched them buying, you know, Ferrari Medina Spiders when they were first coming out while we we're living in an apartment. And then I watched them get a second one and a third one and a fourth one. And I'm like, Man, you only have one butt, right? And that car looks so similar. What's, what's the difference? I get it if you get like, you get your super sports car and an SUV. Okay, I can understand that. Or you get this car and then that car and they have two polar opposites that's cool when you start to get five 
six, seven, eight, nine cars. And so you hear my story, I post all the time. I haven't owned a car in seven years, right? I've worn the same watch for 12 years. And so I've had it embodied inside of my brain watching football players, athletes, rappers, friends, business friends that just overspend and get these huge mansions, all these things. Like, I just don't buy stuff. I want to make enough money to buy a piece of companies. Like, I don't want to buy a watch. I want to buy a piece of a watch company. Like you hear Jay-Z say some of those lines, and then, yeah. right? He doesn't want to buy a nightclub. He wants to, right. It's a similar concept for me. I don't care about the stuff. Do I like the stuff? Yes. I want to be very clear. I like this stuff. It's cool. My friends all have it. It's fun to watch. It's fun to see what they're doing with it. It's fun to participate sometimes and jump in their cool car. I just couldn't even imagine buying a fancy car, even if it was like 0.01%. I'm not saying this is the, the number, but even if it was 0.01% of my net worth, I still wouldn't buy it. I think I could use that 250000 to do this, 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 and this. And I'd rather buy 250000 in stock in a Tesla than buying a Tesla. And so for me, it's, it's been ingrained in me because I watched it. I've watched very, very close friends with $28 million contracts end up borrowing 20 grand for me because they couldn't pay their bills. I've watched people with really crazy contracts that now live in a two bedroom apartment when they had, I mean, crazy number, like 50 million, $80 million type contracts living in a two bedroom apartment now because it's all gone. And so I watched it in real life. And I think that's why it's so ingrained inside of me. So would you... Do you think people buy most of those stuff to impress other people or because that's really what they want? They, they see, they find enjoyment out of it. I think it's a combination of things for everyone. So one is it fills a void, right? If I get this Lamborghini, I will be happy. If I get that new Rolex and I add diamonds to it, I will then be happy. And if I add more diamonds, I'll for sure be happy. Right. And so a lot of times we're getting those things to create happiness. And then it does create happiness for one day or one week maybe one month if you're lucky. The hard part is people don't realize you get numb to those things. You look at your watch every single day for months and months and months and years and years and years. It's not as cool. It's cool to the people that see it for the first time, just like a magic trick. But if you did a magic trick every single day for the last 20 years and you just kept seeing the same magic trick, it's not that exciting to you, right? It's very boring. Same way inside of your own company. You do your own company for 20 years. You do your podcast for 20 years. It will become Groundhog Day for you. It'll be very repetitive. But for someone on the outside looking in, whoa, you've had a podcast for 20 years. You've had this guest, this guest. And so you, you'd feel numb to it, right? Because you live inside of it. And so people don't realize once you get the Lamborghini or once you get the fancy watch, you live inside of it because it's with you every single day. And so I, I think they're getting it, one, for filling a void, trying to get happiness. Two, they're thinking that it will impress other people. Will it impress other people? Yes. Anybody that says it won't is lying because people are impressed by shiny things. People are impressed by those checkmark things that, we all think that we should get or want to get with money, right? If you make a million dollars, you should then go buy this thing. If you make $10 million, you should have multiple of these things. And so it's silly for when people say that it doesn't impress people. It does because you watch the reactions. If you post, if I posted with a Lamborghini versus without a Lamborghini, it would have way more engagement with a fancy car, right? Not even close because people now have something visual that they aspire to. And so there's a combination of things mentally, emotionally that trigger these things of making people want to buy it. But mostly, I would say it's to fill a void inside. And but you raise a great point because I, I actually just posted about this the other day about the truth about entrepreneurship. That if you if you go to hashtag entrepreneurship on Instagram, you see all the things that you were just talking about: the Lamborghinis, the jets, the things like that. I, I don't know. Most entrepreneurs I know don't have any of those things. Are what? I mean, what's your take on on entrepreneurship these days and the glorification of it? So what's interesting is people think it's exciting to be the CEO and they think they're going to make a ton of money. And I say this very often. Let's say Jason Portnoy starts a brand where he's going to actually make podcast headphones, right? He's going to start. It's called podcastheadphones.com. There's lots of headphone companies in the world, but these are just for podcasts. He's going to crush it. He builds his podcast to millions and millions of listeners. Got a great audience. He knows he's going to be able to market it. Not that expensive because he already built up an audience. That sounds like a good investment to me, right? It's in his niche. He's going to continue to build for free. Great marketing. It makes perfect sense for him. All right, I like this. So I'm going to invest $500,000. Two of my friends are going to buy 100K each. I'm going to put up 300K. We got a a game plan. Two strategic investors plus me. 
500K, going to Jason now. Podcastheadphones.com is going to be his business. He makes blue ones, red ones. He makes ones that light up, right? When someone, he can push a button, they light up when someone says something good. This is going to be fun. Jason goes out there and he absolutely crushes it. In year one, Jason does $645,000 in sales, okay? In his business plan, he said he's only going to do 250000 He goes almost 3X, right? 645,000 sales. The first. Now his valuation is at like 5 million. We invested at a 1 million valuation. So we bought, we bought 50% of the company. We think we're going to crush it. You think you're going to crush it. You're going to make a ton of money this year, right? How much do you think Jason made in year one of this company that he's crushing it in? It rhymes with zero. Why? Okay, well, he did 645,000 in sales. His cost of goods is around $300,000. He has an office, not very fancy. It's only 3,500 bucks a month. What's 3,500 times 12? Well, that's around $42,000. Okay. Well, he has to pay for electricity. He has to pay for utilities. He has to pay for his staff. You know what? He's really good about it. He only has two staff, only pays them three grand a month each. Two staff times, six, that's 6,000 times 12. That's $72,000. Not counting employee taxes and benefits and feeding them sometimes and traveling sometimes to the local conventions. Wait. Jason went to the conventions. You know how much a convention costs? The convention booth is $12,000. Getting there is another $4,000. Staying there and feeding his staff is another $4,000. He spent $20,000 on the convention twice. Wait, he spent $40,000 on that. He spent $72,000 on the staff. He spent $300,000 in cost of goods. I haven't mentioned the IRS yet, right? I haven't talked about taxes. And then at the end of the year, when he thinks he's about to get all this money, because he's crushing. By the way, we're, we're happy. Me and the other two investors, we love Jason. He said he's going to do 250K in sales. He did 645,000. He's got pending orders from Target. Wait, how's he going to fulfill the order from Target? Target wants to buy $2 million worth of headphones from him. That means he's got to come up with a million dollars to manufacture those goods. He can't, he's got to turn down this offer unless he finds other financing. Now he's got to borrow money and pay a percentage on that money because you see where I'm going? When he's when Jason's failing, he doesn't get, to get he doesn't get paid. When he does okay, he doesn't get paid. He's got to pay everyone else, the staff, the overhead, the office, the shipping supplies, the mark. I didn't say it. I didn't mention a penny in marketing yet, right? I didn't mention the merchandising displays that have to go in the retail stores or building out the website for ten grand. I didn't say any of that stuff. The Facebook yet none of that, right? You start to realize at the end of the year, if he's failing, he makes nothing. If he's doing okay, he makes nothing. And if he's crushing it, he definitely makes nothing because he's got to put the money back in to make more headphones, to sell more headphones for next year. And so entrepreneurship, it sounds exciting on paper and it sounds exciting when you see someone doing it, you know, showing their highlight reel in their videos. But the reality is I didn't even say a problem yet. I said all the good things for the year and he still didn't make any money, let alone if there was problems along the way. Love that example. Uh, Look, you, you've been called the king of social media. How important is building a strong brand presence to, to success? So a personal brand happens to, whether you like it or not, right? You could be in Alabama with three kids and to someone, they think of you as the mom in Alabama with three kids. You might be a real estate agent that also has cooking videos and crushes it and also makes custom clothing for children. But I don't know that. Jason doesn't know that. We see your social media and you never post about that. You just post about your three kids. We don't know. So you're the mom with three kids in Alabama. To create a personal brand and tell your story instead of Jason and I assuming something that, you know, she just makes content about her kids and has a happy life in Alabama. That's, that's great. If you want to be a real estate agent that has notoriety, make content about being a real estate agent on every single platform. If you want us to know that you make custom clothes for kids so that Jason and I could buy custom clothes as gifts for kids, well, you gotta make content about your custom clothes that you make for kids. If you want us to know about your cooking channel and your passion for cooking, well, you can't just do it for YouTube because that's the platform that you like. You've gotta make content on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, and TikTok so that we hear about and know about it. And when you're talking on Clubhouse, we want to go to your YouTube channel because we heard it on all these other platforms. How much does it cost to make content for Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, LinkedIn, TikTok? 
zero dollars and zero cents. And so it doesn't make any sense to me when people don't make content for all the other platforms because you don't have to recreate content for all the other platforms. And so as you're building a personal brand, a lot of stuff happens because now when Jason and I watch you on social media, we know you're a real estate agent. So if we ever want to send you clients, boom, there we go. We know you make custom clothes. Jason and I want to buy some gifts. Boom. We know where to go. We know you have a cooking channel. Wait, Jason and I work with advertisers and brands all the time. I know this company that wants to advertise on a cooking channel. Boom, this is perfect. I message you. I don't even know you. I just follow you, right? I don't know you. I live in LA. You live in Alabama. But because I saw you on social media and I saw you make good content about clothing, I went down the rabbit hole and saw you also post about your food channel. And now my social media agency decides to get you 50 grand for your cooking channel for the rest of the year. That's why a personal brand is important. So let's talk top tips. Let's, let's get tactical for a second. What, you know, you know, the tactical ways or, or, or the top ways people can use social media to dominate their market. Daily content, not, not three pieces, five pieces, 10 pieces a day. Some people say you should do all this. Nobody's going to do that, right? Unless you have a full production team and a full editing team. That's not, that's too overwhelming. And obviously oftentimes when it's too overwhelming, people choose nothing. Do one piece of content per day. And by the way, that can also be with words, with written, written content. It does not have to be a video and photo every day. So if you end up with three or four videos in a week, one or two photos in a week, and one or two written posts in a week, you've now removed the overwhelming fear that you need to post 20, 50, 100 times a week. You don't. You want that one post a day to create top of mind awareness so that when Jason and I are thinking about buying a gift, we think of your custom clothing in Alabama. When Jason and I later tonight have dinner and someone brings up a cooking channel, oh, wait, we've, we've been watching this woman in Alabama. She's got a great cooking channel. She's so funny. Her kids are in there with her. Boom. When we think of someone says the word real estate, I'm looking for a house and it's 11 o'clock at night and we're on social media. Someone's like, I'm thinking about moving to Alabama. I think of you in Alabama, right? And so the tactical thing is make one piece of content per day and you don't have to do it every single day. Meaning on Sunday, record 12 pieces of content, make six photos and write out six pieces of content. And it doesn't have to all be for that week. It could be for the month. All of a sudden you did 12, six and six. You got 24 pieces of content. That's 24 days of content for that month. And in between there, when stuff is in real time, right? There's a birthday today, make content. There's a, you're speaking somewhere, make content. You're doing a podcast today, make content. In real time throughout the month, make that content as well for those real time moments. But the other 24 days of the month, You've got something to post because it's already in your phone. So I think the most practical thing is be prepared for the month. Make content so that you already have content ready. So that when a Wednesday at 9 a.m., you're like, oh, Dan and Jason said I should post today. I don't feel like it. Well, you already have it in your phone because you recorded it three Sundays ago. Love it. And, and you, also, you also talk about um, no politics, no religion on social media, which leads me to... I'd, I'd love your, your take on what's going on with cancel culture. Are we too sensitive right now? Or are we just, or have we just been, I guess, insensitive for too long that now it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. So there's a combination in the sixties and seventies and eighties and nineties. When you watched pop culture TV, when you watched married with children and you saw intense sexism and those jokes, were we insensitive or is that comedy? It could be a combination of both, right? However, to be mad about that time when it was normalized at the time is crazy. It's actually crazy. And you want to try to cancel me for calling it crazy? Go ahead. You can't cancel me because I don't care if you subscribe. And I say that because I'm speaking about things that are factual and not emotional. Factually, during those times, there was racism. There was sexism. It was normal to do. Remember in the 70s, like peace, love, and, and people were just having sex and drugs out in, out in Woodstock? It was normalized then, right? And so to be mad at someone for doing something during a normal situation when everyone else was doing it and everyone smoking cigarettes because it was cool and cigarettes were on TV every day and in every poker room in the world, people were smoking cigarettes for 12 hours at a time, it was normal then. If you smoked a cigarette in a casino now, you'd get thrown out. So we adjusted over time, but to be mad at someone for what they did back then, it's, it's, it's psychotic, it's rude. It's not fair because in those times it wasn't. So 
Are we too sensitive now? Uh, yes, there's no question. It's not close. It's completely overboard. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing, like Mr. Potato Head, his name is literally Mr. Potato Head and he has a wife and kids. He has to have a penis. Let's just be clear. That's how biology works. It's not a choice. There's no emotion to it. You don't, you don't get to decide in that moment. Mr. Potato Head, to create a baby with Mrs. Potato Head and have those multiple kids, had to have a penis. And so to say he doesn't now is not real. It's not real life. It's just, it's, it's biology. It's science. It's right. It's not an emotion. And so, and it was never rude to be called Mr. Potato Head. He is by definition, a Mr. that has a Mrs. that has children. And so that is obscene. That is absurd. It is frustrating to hear about, especially in these moments when there's way more things to think about and talk about in our, our world and lives. Uh, it's cuckoo. And same thing with Dr. Seuss and all these things that are popping up when you, you see in mainstream society other things that are completely overboard and then picking and choosing these things that have no relevance. And anyways, and so are we too sensitive? Yes, obviously there, these are examples that just happened this week. There's been things that have been happening nonstop for years. Uh, so those are frustrating because they don't coincide with reality. And the reality is Mr. Potato Head needed his biological parts to have children. And so, and nothing about Mr. Potato Head being a mister is rude, literally nothing. Same thing, whether it's, there's a lot of different characters and uh, brands that have been removing the sexualization of their character, that's, that's it's insane. So it's frustrating to watch um, and it's getting worse, but also on the flip side, a lot of people are getting very frustrated about cancel culture. And at some point, I believe we might even cancel cancel culture. So if you're a business, how do you how do you then walk that line, right? Because it must be so hard to navigate those waters of is this post going to get people uh, agitated for no for no apparent reason? Yeah, the reason I say never post about sex, religion, or race, and obviously in politics, is because you're guaranteeing that fifty percent of your audience will be mad. That's it. It's just math and common sense. If you are a brand, you do not need to jump in to the conversation when there's race going on. You don't. There's never going to be a moment, one, where you're right, two, where you're not going to offend a big portion of your audience, 20 to 50% of them or more, could be 60, 70, 80%. No matter what, you will offend a portion of your audience. Three, it's not your place, right? If you're in airlines talking about race, why? If you're a soda brand talking about race, why? What on earth do you have to do with race? What on earth do you have to do with Mr. Potato Head? Coca-Cola is never supposed to post about Mr. Potato Head. Southwest Airlines is never supposed to post about Dr. Seuss. It just doesn't make any sense in the world. It's not their place. It, it's, it's insanity. They are a airline. They are a soda brand. They are a clothing brand, et cetera. Uh, I call it a negative free roll in poker. A negative free roll means only bad things can happen and there's no upside because the audience that agrees with you, they're already drinking the Kool-Aid, right? If you post about Trump or Biden, well, your Trump supporters, they already like Trump and they already follow you. So you're not gonna make them follow you more. They already follow you. The Biden supporters are now mad at you, right? And they're gonna leave or talk crap or whatever. And you're gonna cause frustration between the two of them on your, on your page. That happens with sex, that happens with race, that happens with politics, happens with religion. So talking about religion, listen, you have faith, that's fine. You want to be faith-based, but talking about other people's religions, that's cuckoo because you're going to cause frustrations and lose a big portion of your audience. There is no upside because the people that have the same faith as you, they're already drinking the Kool-Aid. They already follow you. And so I say this for personal brands, corporate brands, et cetera. There is no upside for you to get involved in these conversations. Most of the time, you shouldn't be involved in them because it's not applicable to your business, personal brand, life, et cetera. And it's, it's causing more noise and taking away what should be the focus is you. You're the real estate agent in Alabama that makes clothing and cooking videos. That should be what the content is about. And I'm not trying to quiet anyone out. You know, I'm not trying to shut anyone's mouth. However, for your business, for your brand, for your life, you will have a better life, a better brand, and a better business if you don't talk about those things because you provide for your family, you provide for your platform, you provide for your charity, you provide for whatever you're doing by having people 
interact with you about what you do, not about what you think about Mr. Potato Head. So what about like all these athletes or, or musicians, uh, regardless of what, uh, I'll tell you my personal opinion. When, when I go hear a band play, I, I'm, I'm not there to hear a political conversation, right? I'm, I'm here to hear the music, regardless whether I agree with the political belief or, or disagree. I want, I want you to play the music. But then you get like the, are you telling me to shut up and dribble or do I not have a platform? Where's the line in that? So I think it's interesting is on, if they want to post about it on their social media, that's, that's understandable. Listen, people have emotions, they have opinions, they want to be heard, and they want to have a conversation right? There are plenty of artists that want to have the conversation. If LeBron James, Kanye West want to have the conversation, it makes sense for their brand because they enjoy the conversation, they enjoy the discussion, and they they want to impact the world. That's different, right? They know that some of their audience is going to be mad. If they all of a sudden support Trump, or they all of a sudden support a certain race or a certain culture, or a certain action that's happening, or a certain protest, or a certain thing that's happening, them supporting that they want to make a stand and they understand that they're going to alienate a portion of their audience and they're going to create emotion from their other part of their audience. And so they are doing it as a platform and you can't fault them for that. It's not a shut up and dribble moment. They're still dribbling. Now, what you mentioned is different. When I'm watching them play basketball and I paid money for that and the brands paid for that, that's a different situation. When you're stopping the basketball game that we all paid for, that's not the moment. You, everyone has social media. You do TV news interviews. Those are your moments. We are escaping for those three hours from all of that noise. And during those three hours, I don't want you to sit on the court, right? I don't want you to have your, your emotional stand during those three hours because we did pay for that and the brands paid for that. And candidly, it changed your life forever because you're making tens of millions of dollars based on everyone else pitching in in those moments. What you say before and after that is a human that is totally allowed to say whatever they want. I think it's taking away from what we're doing, what we're all paying for and watching at our moments in time to be able to decide if we want to listen to those things. We can decide to watch your TV interview. We can decide to listen to your social media, but we've already paid to watch your three hours. We did. We already decided that we're doing that. And it's unfair in those moments. The same way when you're at the concert and you paid for those three hours to escape and you're on a date, that isn't the time for Taylor Swift to tell us about this or you two to tell us about that. In those moments, we're paying for our escapism and we're paying very well for it. We're paying a very high premium for those three hours of music or three hours of uh, basketball, et cetera. And so I just feel like in those moments, it's not fair to the people that paid, brands, the stadium, the staff and everyone involved in those moments because we didn't get to decide to be a part of your political discussion. Got it. it. Makes total sense. I, I, I want to switch gears to something. And when I started the podcast, I said you were one of the most connected people I, I've, I've ever been introduced to. So talk to me about networking for a second. What's your advice to the listeners who, you know, they want to also start bumping elbows with some of these celebrities and some big names. How can they start doing that? Sure. So you often hear the term, your network is your net worth, right? What's interesting is you can build your network morning, noon, and night, whenever you choose to. And when you don't want to, you can hide inside of your turtle shell. Or when you want to, you can go out into real world events, interact on social media, and force the conversation. What I mean is, let's say you go out to an event, right? As events start coming back this year, and hopefully full-fledged next year, going out to an event in your space, let's say you're in the real estate space or the fashion space, et cetera. Well, when you go to that real estate event, you're going to meet people in the real estate space. When you go to that fashion convention, you're going to meet people in the fashion space. That is guaranteeing for you to network with people specifically in your category. When you go to a local bar or restaurant and talk to the people at the restaurant or bar, you are gambling, if you will. At that restaurant or bar, you're going to meet the woman or man that's in the accounting space or stock market, or they buy and sell rare coins, right? They're the mechanic. You don't know what you're going to have because it's going to be a smorgasbord at the restaurant or nightclub. Should you not network there? You can, because it's fun to meet the person in the restaurant space, to meet the, the, the rare coin dealer. It's fun to meet those other characters, but for your specific business, going to events that are in your niche is critical. If you don't have any real estate events in your, in your area, if you don't have any fashion events in your area, make one. And I'm not saying make a big convention, make a meetup once a month at a local restaurant on a Tuesday night. You know why on a Tuesday night? they're dead the tuesday night is very quiet for them 
And so when they normally charge five grand to rent out their restaurant, they're going to charge you a zero to 500 bucks just to pay for some staff because for zero to 500 bucks, they know you're going to bring 47 people in the real estate game on a Tuesday, right? Find a local venue, an art gallery, a car dealership that's like got cool fancy cars that wants rich people to come by, a fashion or art gallery, like a fashion studio that wants people, 47 people in the fashion space to come by and host an event. What happens if you host an event? You become the man or woman in your town. The people are gonna create content with you because they're at your events. It edifies you because you're the one hosting the mic and inviting everyone over. It allows you to call anybody in your local town or business. You're in the fashion game. You now have an excuse to invite Damon John to your event, virtually or in person. Why else would you have an excuse to call Damon John, right? And now Damon John is inclined to want to answer your call or email because you're throwing an interesting fashion event in Alabama. Maybe he's not going to fly to Alabama, but he'll come in virtually. And then when you throw it in New York or he happens to be in Alabama in six months from now, who's he going to hit up? You. The same thing applies for real estate. All of a sudden you're messaging Grant Cardone and Ed Milet and different people that are investing in the real estate game. You now have an excuse to call the biggest people in the world, hit them up on social media, email them, call them, et cetera, to speak at your event, attend your event virtually or in person. So that happens locally. It happens nationally and internationally. And even if they won't be able to attend, right? Most likely Ed or Grant's not flying in. Most likely Damon John or Kevin Hart's not flying in. However, your name is now on the radar with them. They now know about the mom with three kids that's a real estate agent that throws these fashion events and real estate events in Alabama. They may not come for one year, two years, or three years, but when they do, they're going to remember you or think about you. And so I think it's fascinating for people, one, networking at live events, two, throwing your own events, and then three, embedding yourself into the internet. If you interact with people on the internet, you build up a relationship for those real life moments, right? In those real life moments, they've thought about you because you've interacted with them for the last seven months. And now when you make an ask, or now when you say, hey, at Damon, I'm throwing an event, will you be a virtual speaker? But you've been commenting on Damon's stuff for the last seven months. He's much more inclined than if you went from zero to saying, hey, I need you to speak here, right? If you just have a cold DM, probably not gonna ever open it. But if you've been commenting and reposting his stuff for seven months, he might. That's part of networking. And so I don't think of networking as taking a business card and putting it in your pocket or collecting a phone number and having it in your phone. I look at it as building relationships, interacting with people, creating value, being ready in those moments, creating that top of mind awareness. So then when you are ready to throw that event, or go speak, or you happen to be in New York, you want to get a meeting, you are much more inclined because you've been networking that whole time. So then talk to me about the pay to play part of this, right? Because look, for, for this podcast, um, you know, this isn't my full time job. I don't pay for any of the guests. Dan could could attest this the amount of times I've messaged him to come on. There, there, there's no pay to it. But what are your thoughts about in terms of networking, the pay to play, like the pay for proximity? What's your take on that? And then most importantly, if you're going to do that, how do you then turn that relationship uh, or that or that meeting into something of a relationship versus not just being seen as a transaction? Like Dan, I paid you a hundred dollars to come to. I paid you a hundred thousand dollars to come to my event. How do you then see me as a peer or a colleague? How do I turn that into a peer or colleague versus, hey, this is Jason. He paid me for an event. Sure. So I'm candidly, I'm probably one of the best people in the world to ask that because I literally do that. I throw the most expensive mastermind in the world where a hundred people paid me a hundred thousand dollars each to be in my mastermind group. And then I also have a $30,000 one for real estate. And I also have a $10,000 one for small business owners. So I have three levels of masterminds that people pay for proximity. That's literally on our website. It's in our emails. It's part of our marketing is people are paying for proximity. If you pay a hundred thousand dollars to come to my mastermind, well, guess who's going to be in the room? A hundred other people that can afford a hundred thousand dollars to be in my group that all have to have a minimum of $10 million company. And my instructors all have $100 million plus companies. And I'm gonna go book Mark Wahlberg, Chris Jenner, Magic Johnson, Tyga. Those are the real people that attended my first event. And so people paid for proximity to be in that room. Why does that matter? Well, if you are in the room with 100 people that paid 100K each and have a $10 million company, and there's 20 instructors that have big companies as well, 
and there's celebrities, business people, athletes, et cetera, in the room. Well, you cut out all the noise. And so now you're closer with me because we're spending a three-day weekend together and we're doing it three times in for the year. You're interacting with a bunch of people in your space and in similar spaces that have big companies. So you filtered out the noise. You know that person has a $30 million cannabis company. They've got a $62 million foods company. That person does 40 million in credit cards, merchant transactions. Like, you know what they do and you know that they're big and you know that they've been vetted. And so paying for proximity is interesting for mastermind groups in that example. And by the way, same thing I said about events, you can have your own mastermind. Don't have to charge for it. Or you can if you want to when it's, when it's big enough. You can have your own mastermind in Alabama and the mom with three kids can have a mastermind group for people to have proximity with her. She now has an excuse to go call the other mom in town that her and her husband own three car dealerships. And the other mom in town, they own 16 gyms. The other mom in town who's been selling $45 million in real estate, she's the number one agent. And say, hey, let's have a once a month mastermind group together and just put together this badass group of women in the middle of Alabama, right? And so paying for proximity. Now, the next part is you asked is, how does it look later, right? If someone paid to be in that room or paid me to speak or paid you to be on your podcast, how do people look at it? Well, it depends on what value you bring later and who you are as a person. Meaning once you've got in the room, right? You paid to be in the room. Now, what happens after the fact? So if I paid to be in a room with Ed Milet and now and Andy Forsella, they have a mastermind as well. If you paid to be in that room and now you're networking with all those people in that group and you paid next time Ed Milet to speak, but he normally charges 100,000 but because you're in his group, he charges you 25 or 50,000, for example. Well, you've now built multiple relationships with that person. And then the next time you might get that, Ed Milet to speak for free because you've built this relationship by being in the room. Does that person look down on you for paying them? No. Are you then putting yourself in a position to say, hey, I want to start a business. Will you invest in my company? Or, hey, I want you to join the advisory board of my podcast headphones company because I've now been in the room with, let's say you've been in the room with Ed Milet three times. And now you're like, hey, podcast headphones is launching. Dan and two friends already put up 500K. Ed, I just want you to be on the advisory board because you have a big following in the podcast space. The discussion is way different because you've been in the room with Ed three times. You paid for proximity, being a part of his mastermind or being a part or booking him to speak at your events. And now stuff happens. Many of my relationships have came from booking people to speak in my events. There's some people that I'm close with that will come speak for free. Most all of my business friends speak for free because I will then speak for free at theirs. And then around us, people pay us to speak at their events. And I pay certain celebrities to speak at my events. And then for the future, I can get them for free or cheaper or just donate to their charity and they don't need a speaking fee. And so my answer bluntly is no, paying for proximity is not wrong. I'm not saying that people need to pay 100,000 or 30,000 or 10,000. You could pay 50 bucks and 100 bucks to pay for proximity by being in the room at your local events and then interacting with the speakers at that event, right? There's a local real estate event in Alabama, pay a hundred bucks to go to that event. As soon as you see the speakers that you like, go up and shake their hand and tell them that you're also an agent in Alabama for the last seven years. And you've been raising three kids and you also sell clothing and tell them your story. They will have an emotional attachment to you and you paid to be there. And now you try to book them for your, your local events. See what I'm saying? Putting yourself in the room is what you're paying for and paying for that proximity. And then it's up to you to carry on the relationship afterwards. So let's talk about that because you, it's very important that when you go in and you are going to pay for proximity, which it, it's an investment, not a cost, right? I think that's a mindset issue. Sure. Um, you're going to make that investment to be in the room. What's the best way to craft that, that pitch and story in order? Cause you know, so many people get into that room and then they bomb it because they don't know how to present themselves. They don't know how to do anything. So what are some of your tips in order to present yourself properly to build those relationships? One is, know the room. You have to know who's going to be in the room and why. Two, you can't be a wallflower. You pay to go to an event and then sit in the corner on your phone tweeting and texting. Well, why did you pay to be in the room, right? Just so you can take a picture in the room. And so you're missing out on these opportunities that when you go there, you have to go there with a goal. Okay, I'm going to Ed Milet's event and I want to make sure I meet that speaker, that speaker, and I saw someone post that I follow is going to be at the same event. I'm going to make sure I go talk to them. And then when you're there, make it not just a point, like you're not leaving until you go find those four people that you knew you wanted to meet and also try to meet other people because you want to 
you know, the world works in mysterious ways, also meet other people. And so I would say, okay, if I'm going to meet four people intentionally, I'm going to meet four people unintentionally. And if I go there with this goal that I'm going to shake hands with those eight people, stuff's going to happen, right? Even out of those eight people, I might only end up getting to follow up with one or two of them. I might only have a relationship with one of them, for, but I made that commitment and I put myself in a position to get lucky. What that means is oftentimes people go into the room hoping to get lucky, but not in the position to get lucky. Meaning you go to the room and you stand in the corner, you're not going to get lucky. Ed Milet's not walking over to you in the corner and saying, hey, buddy, what's going on? You want to take my number? <laughs> right? It's not going to happen because you're, you're the wallflower in the corner. He might come over and pat you on the back like, oh, come and join the event. But it's unlikely that you're going to build a relationship that same way. So being intentional about what you're going for, understanding the rooms that you're going into. Same thing applies on social media. Same concept. And then when you have that moment to get lucky, you put yourself in that position and you're in that moment of shaking hands. It does not need to be transactional in the first few seconds, right? You, a lot of times, are setting yourself up for the future. They now know of you for the future. You don't have to go in there like, hey, my name is Jason. Will you jump on my podcast? Shake your hand at my let, right? If you do that, you start off in a very transactional point. If you meet Ed and you're like, hey, I've had this podcast. I've had a bunch of your mutual friends on my podcast. I've had over X amount of downloads. Things have been great. You've now told a story about yourself and now Ed can create in this, I'm just using Ed as this example. Now Ed can create in his mind, oh, that'd be great. Maybe I can jump on your podcast th later this year. Got it. You oh, flipped the narrative about who you are and what you are, but you were intentional to meet the people that you want to meet. I love it. We'll start wrapping up, but I'll, I'll, I have to talk about sports cards it's funny we had someone on the podcast uh who came on to talk about it and it actually be one it was actually one of our highest listened to episodes so just from someone who's opened up a card place you know cards and coffee and you're actually in in, in california to, uh they're now about it what's going on right why is it all the rage and why are celebrities and people dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars on it and i guess I, the follow-up to that would be is this a fad sure so as far as the fad goes, you know, sports cards have been around for 100 years. Have they been gone through roller coasters of popularity? Of course. This time it's different. Out of all those roller coasters of time, this one's much different because back then we never had eBay, StockX, social media, the big auction sites. You didn't have all this access to buy, sell, and trade as we did back then. Because back then, if you went, wanted to find a certain card, you were looking on what there was no internet like that you weren't there was no stock x it didn't exist ebay wasn't fully you know fully functional 20 years ago when back when cars were big back then and so i think we're in a much different place from that perspective and information you can now find out how much a card is get it graded sell it all from your phone anywhere in the world and so dealing with the process of sports cards and pokemon etc is that there's so much more information access to learn what's cool, what's worth money, how can I sell it, who did what, when did they slam the basketball, what is Charizard worth, what's Logan Paul doing? So, so that information is also important and access. Why are people and celebrities and athletes jumping in? About two years ago, Gary V asked me to go to Chicago to a convention called The National. And at that convention, I was just gonna stop by for a few hours and he ended up convincing me to stay for a few days. And that's how I got hooked, is that I was at his booth for a couple of days watching his excitement while this guy's got multiple hundred million dollar company with 900 employees and he's buying and selling a baseball card for 120 bucks selling it for 180 bucks across the hallway making 60 dollars, spending two hours on that whole deal when the guy gets six figures to speak in an event right that 60 dollars transaction made him smile for two hours and then at dinner he was bringing up that transaction and so that joy is priceless it's not about the 60 bucks. It's the, it's the game of it. And so I got addicted at that time. And then over the next few months, I started inviting my friends to get addicted. Steve Aoki, Lewis Howes, the guy that bought the $5 million uh, Mickey Mantle card last July had $0 in cards. Hmm. Right. And so I asked him about, Hey, I was like, Hey, I've been investing a bunch of sports cards. Let me explain it all. And I was telling him about the zoom. I, I made a zoom call. And on the Zoom call, I invited a bunch of friends, business people, real estate, cannabis, podcasters, all these people. And then like Lewis Howes buys a bunch of cards because he starts like, okay, he likes it as an alternative investment, but he was also used to be an athlete. 
Steve Aoki starts buying cards because for the first time in his life, he's bored, stuck at home because he normally is at 300 events a year. He goes down the rabbit hole, buys a ton of sports cards and then a ton of Pokemon cards and all of a sudden is making Pokemon content. And then Logan Paul jumps in and all these different characters from cannabis, music, podcast, real estate, etc. There's a couple different trigger points. One is nostalgia, right? 20 or 30 years ago, this age group of those 30 to 60 year old used to buy or sell sports cards, comic books, et cetera, back in the days, Pokemon, whatever, Magic the Gathering. And so there's an emotional nostalgia. Two is there's a bit of gambling to it, right? You can buy a pack, you can buy a card. Some of it's investing, some of it's a bit of gambling because when you buy an unopened pack, you're not sure what's going to be in it. It could be worth five bucks or 5,000. There's an investing element because I've never seen an asset class have this much of a raise. Like Gary and I talk about, these are cards that Gary was buying at that convention for $1,000, the LeBron James rookie card for $1,000. That card is now $32,000. That is a 3,200% margin, 3,200% growth. That's not just LeBron, Michael Jordan, Luka Doncic, Zion Williamson, Serena Williams, all these different characters from different sports have had 400%, 1,000%, 3,000% increases the last two years. So there's all these elements of nostalgia, gambling, investing, and also passion, right? If you like tennis or you like Pokemon or you like basketball or you like baseball, it makes it more fun to bet on a player rather than betting on the team. So what are your tips for people who want to who wanna get involved and start? So focus on rookie cards. If you're going to go in sports cards, focus on rookie cards. Uh, it's very important because the market has determined that rookie cards are the main focus. Uh, I prefer graded cards because it, it shows you what the value is going to be. You can get an approximate value if you know a grade. If it's the PSA 8, a PSA 9, a PSA 10, PSA is the grading company. At a higher level PSA graded card, you're going to have much more insight as to what that card is worth. A raw card, you're guessing. There's a lot of guessing involved in that. Can you buy raw cards? Of course you can. And just more guessing. Uh, study a bunch. Just go on the forums, go on to the Discord chats, go into Facebook groups. Uh, we have the largest Facebook group in the world. It's free. Uh, it's called the Copy Breakers. You can go add yourself on the Facebook group and just see content all the time, right? Go on YouTube, uh, read articles from 1.37 p.m. Uh, Gary Vee has this 1.37 p.m. They do great articles. Um, there's YouTube. There's YouTube content you can see for free. Listen to these sports card podcasts. Uh, there's a kid named At Buster. At Buster has a podcast called Talking Shop, where it just talks about sports cards. And so finding people that are teaching you about this, researching it, and then think about the players that you like. If you like Serena Williams, or you like Tiger Woods, or you like LeBron James, or Luka Doncic, or Larry Bird, or Magic Johnson, you like these characters, buy their rookie card. Even if the card goes down, you enjoy it, right? You own it as an asset class. You enjoy that player. We've watched it go up over the years because of supply and demand. And so don't go buy cards that have tens of thousands of that card in supply, unless you're buying it for a hobby, right? If you're buying it for an investment, buying low supply cards, rookie cards, if you are feeling like the demand for that player will go up over the course of time, like I do with Serena Williams, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, et cetera, you will most likely win because supply will get lower. They will never make more supply of those rookie cards. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. The demand will rise over time if you believe that player will continue to be famous. I believe Kevin Durant and Serena Williams will be famous long after sports. They will be on TV. They will be investing, et cetera. And so understanding all these different elements of why you should invest. Yeah. Getting into it. So, so yeah, I, I, I went down the rabbit hole. I started. I started. Um, I'll end with this. I know uh, philanthropy is super important to you. Uh, I mean, and I could tell not just because of how you post and what you talk about, but because you actually started your journey uh, when, you know, when you talked about your entrepreneurial journey, you brought up the charity and, and that was forefront in your mind. So I can tell it's important to you. It's something that's truly important to me. So talk to me a little bit more about and to the listeners about your charity and, you know, I heard, I heard something that you cover all the overhead uh, for people who don't know what that means is that um, it's all different than a lot of other charities that when someone gives a dollar to the charity, the full dollar goes through. And I think it, I, a lot of people think that's the case with most charities, but it really isn't. So, so let, I, I want to give you the platform a little bit to talk more about it. Sure. So I started, it's called Model Citizen Funds. We started eight years ago. 
it's a zero percent charity so i cover all overhead past present and future i'm always going to cover all the overhead meaning staff marketing events anything that happens i pay for everything uh, most charities have quite a large overhead because they have staff marketing events etc uh, some of that there's a greater good it's it's fine and other people you know abuse it a little bit uh, so i prefer to always have it as a zero percent charity and we make backpacks for the homeless each backpack has 150 emergency supply items inside it's half food and drinks half is cleaning supplies a watch poncho sleeping bag different items that they can use uh, and then we give it out to homeless shelters teen abuse shelters women abuse shelters and orphanages that's it I'm not curing cancer. I can't cure AIDS. Billions and tons of billions have been done for that. You can go down the rabbit hole of have those things been cured 10, 20, 30 years ago? Yes, they have. And so I know that I'm not gonna be good to just go raise billions of dollars for some specific uh, cause. I wanted something that I could see, feel and touch and could help someone get back on their feet or feel emotionally stable for some time. And so inside of there, we put books, checklist of their local community of how to get a job, local shelters, like we're giving information to someone that's homeless to help them get back on their feet. Is it gonna change their life forever? No. But I know that if someone gets 14 pounds of supplies, they're gonna have some food and drinks. They're gonna have some supplies that they can use. They're gonna have a watch and sleeping bag and things that they can use for a long period of time and it will help them. And so to me, it's the conversation. It's not about the donation. Meaning I throw all these charity events to raise money for my charity way more i try to raise awareness for my charity so people replicate me and knock me off and do themselves you don't need to buy my backpacks with supplies make your own backpack with supplies make a ziploc bag with supplies make a brown paper bag with supplies in your local town for four people or 40 people or 400 people whatever you can afford to do more for i want the time and energy to happen i want the dad to take his two kids and fill up ziploc bags with supplies and go give it out for that for that moment for that story for that memory for those kids that's way more important than donating money to my charity. Is there a reason why you, you, you chose homeless? So I realized that it's something that I could actually see, feel, and touch. I raised money for other people's charities for years. I would get them $156,000 on a Sunday at my charity poker tournament. And then Monday, I don't hear from them. Tuesday, next Wednesday, next month, the next month. I don't know what happened with 156000 And so I wanted something that people could see, feel, and touch. Someone donates 156000 to my charity. We're going to make... 1,560 backpacks filled with, you know, what is that? Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of supplies inside. Those are going to go out to the homeless and they can give it out themselves. I'll ship them all 1,560 backpacks. They can go give it out with their staff and family and friends. And so I wanted something that was physical, something that you could see. If I show up to a women's abuse shelter with 50 backpacks, or I go to the veterans with 50 backpacks, they're going to have stuff and it's going to be something that they could physically hold. And so I spent five months interviewing homeless and military on what they would want inside of a backpack if they were dropped off in the middle of nowhere. And so that's how we curated all the items inside. Smart. Dan, thank you so much for doing this. Um, you're impossible not to find, but in case people want to reach out to you and find you, how can they connect with you? So all my social media is the same. It's at Dan Fleischman. It's also important for you guys to do the same thing. Your screen name, your bio, and your photo should be the same on every major social media platform. Love it. Thank you, Dan. Really appreciate you.